Uh, thanks for coming and thanks for the organizers, the DSBA Research, for, for organizing this and, and inviting me. I'm super happy to be here. Um, today I'm going to talk about mobile app security. Um, and uh, we've been discussing security uh, yesterday and today. And um, when we talk about security, we always talk about uh, securing uh, REST APIs, backend, web applications, and so on. But uh, so my goal today is to. Uh, make sure that we that you go home with understanding which are the unique challenges of mobile application security. I mean, it's, it's not uh, completely different from the rest of, of security topics that we've been discussing these days, but it certainly has some um, uniquenesses, and, and that's what I will try to, to point out during my talk today. Okay, so before we get started, let me introduce myself, if the clicker works. Yeah, looks like it's working. So my name is Mark. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Bill38. Bill38 is a, is a startup uh, that was founded in Munich one year ago, a bit more, late 2018. And what we do is, is mobile application security. And there I'm taking care of the, of the product development. I'm, I'm the, the lead architect of the product. Uh, and I'm actually based in Barcelona. Headquarters is in Munich, but the, the technical team is in Barcelona. Uh, here you can find my social network handles. I'm not the too active, but I will be putting the slides. I think the, the guys from the, the, the organizer are going to put it in the website as well. But if you want to contact me, you have the details here. So enough about me. Um, let's get into the details. Today I'm going to structure the talk in two main parts. The first one is, is, uh, is mostly theoretical. It's an introduction of the, about the, the uniquenesses of, of mobile application security. And then I'm going to discuss some, some threats that are common in mobile app. Um, but it's not the threat itself that is interesting for me. It's, it's, it's an excuse to discuss the particularities of, of mobile application security. And then a, a very short recap at the end. OK, so let's, let's get started. Um, so why should we care about mobile application security? The thing is, um, more than half of our users are interacting with our services through the mobile channel. So in, in late 2019, the, the, the change was made that uh, more than half are now interacting through the, through the mobile applications instead of, the, um, of the, the desktop channel. So that's quite a big reason to, to care about mobile application security. Another one is uh, that depending on the industry that you are in, so for example, if you are in, in the banking or in the payment industry, you might be subject to PCI compliance. Um, but other markets as well. So if you are, for example, in the automotive, there's some regulations, uh, healthcare, uh, as, as a financial, you might need some certifications to be able to do business in, in some markets, and you are not going to pass these certifications if your uh, mobile applications are not secure. And last but not least is the fact that, unfortunately, we have to treat the, the smartphone as an untrusted device. So we, as application developers, build our applications, put them on the market, and the users download them, and we just don't know where they are going to run. It's possible that they are going to run in devices that are old, devices that run old, version, uh, old operating system versions that have not been patched. Uh, it's even possible that our applications end up running in, the, in a hacker's device that is trying to reverse engineer our application. So um, different than the, the, what happens when we develop a, a web application, we don't have control of, over where our application is running. Okay? And that leads me to, to the main difference between uh, doing uh, security for, for the backend and doing um, security for, for mobile apps. On a backend, normally what the hacker sees or a pen tester sees is a black box. He sees inputs and outputs, but has exactly no information if we did our, our work properly has no information about what's going on on the inside. And that's the, the black box model. Um, when we do um, security for mobile apps, our hacker, uh, a hacker is going to be able to extract a lot of information from the binary he downloads from the, from the, uh, from the, the marketplaces. So in mobile application security, the security model is, is more or less a gray box model. Of course, it's not a, a white box model because they don't have access to the source code and, and they don't have access to the documentation. But the hacker is going to be able to extract a lot of information about our, our binary. And more precisely, there is never a 100% guarantee that something is going to be secure in an application. So if you have to put, for example, an API key in your app, be sure that if someone wants to extract it, you can protect it as much as you want, but at the end, someone with enough uh, time and resources and determined enough 
is going to be able to extract it. So our goal in mobile application security is never 100% security, is good enough. That's, for me, the key difference when, when talking about mobile application security, okay? So if there's not 100% security, um, is there anything we can do? Well, luckily, yes. So in order to explain this, sorry. In order to explain this, let's put ourselves in the, um, in the shoes of a, of a hacker, and let's try to understand what's going to drive him to, to try to hack our application. It's, when, when we talk about hackers, it's not someone that is uh, doing it for fun, uh, for, for a research project in university, but it's someone that, is, that has a, an economical motivation, okay? And this is how a, a, an attack would look like, ideally, from a hacker's perspective, from the economic perspective. So at the beginning, he's investing uh, some time and resources in trying to find an exploit in our application. Um, so he's actually losing money during the first months of research. At some point, he manages to get an exploit. Uh, it makes it work, it can deploy it. And ideally, he starts earning some money. Um, and then he's able to infect hundreds, thousands, millions of users, and he's getting a lot of revenue out of, out of this exploit. So the plug bar uh, shows how much money he's making at the end, and you can see that he's, uh, at the end, he's earning a lot of money. That's the ideal scenario for them. So what we want to do is we want to make it not attractive for them. We want the hacker to not be able to earn money uh, from, from, from hacking an application, okay? So instead of having something like this, we want to make it look to something like that. Okay? If you notice here, um, at the end, the hacker is losing money. That's our goal. How can we do this? First thing is, we want to force the hacker to invest more time in developing exploit. We want to have these red bars here to be bigger. How we will use um, anti-reversing techniques that, like obfuscation for preventing uh, static analysis, and we are going to use things like debugger detection, emulator detection, um, and all sorts of things to prevent dynamic analysis, because that's what's going to, to give us, it's going to buy us time, and it's going to make it more expensive for the hacker. The second thing we want to do is we want to reduce uh, the, the income that the hacker can get out of it, okay? If you realize these green bars are not as high as they were before, and the way to do this is that, so in the ideal case for the hacker is that he um, develops the exploit once, deploys it, infects millions of users. We want to somehow make sure that an exploit can only work for a small amount of users, okay? So when he develops an exploit and tries to put it on a while, it only works for a subset of users, ideally just one user. It's not always uh, possible, but that's the idea. So in this way, he's earning less money. He spends more time, he's earning less money. And finally, we don't want this hack to be, uh, this exploit to be out in the wild for, for uh, months. So every time that we push our application to, to the markets, we are going to change some things to force the, the hacker to invest some time um, to, to, to keep the exploit working. And this is represented by, by these uh, red bars here. Um, if he has to do this, he's uh, not, uh, not earning as much money as before, and, and every two to three months, he's, he's still having to invest some time. So at the end, if we achieve something like, like this graphic here, we are going to uh, frustrate the hacker, and he's not, it's not going to be profitable for him. And if we are lucky enough, he's going to be a go and, and look somewhere, somewhere else and, and try to hack someone else. So last slide of the introduction is about um, which are the main things to protect in the, in, in the mobile application. First one is obviously user, user data, of course. There's another thing that is uh, often overlooked, which is business data. So if you have, let's say, for example, an application that has a, a premium model, you don't want someone to be able to just remove the checks uh, of whether the user has paid or not, because then he would be able to, to get the, the paid features for free. And this is what I, what I mean when I talk about company data or, or even IP. If you have some algorithms that have to be put in the, in, the, in the application that you've spent some time in developing, you don't want the hacker to be able to reverse it and to steal it and, and use it for, for some other purpose. Okay, and finally, it's uh, DRM. Uh, so if you are Netflix and you are streaming data to your end user's device, 
you don't want your users to be able to just take the video and put it somewhere else because then it's, it's actually hurting your business model. Okay, so these are the, the main things to look for when, when protecting mobile applications. And we should be aware that what is at stake for, for our company and what is it worth for us to, to protect. Okay, let's uh, talk about some common threads. I will start with the, the man in the middle. I'm quite sure you all know what the what, uh, man in the middle is, but yeah, it's basically we have a, a, a mobile endpoint which is connecting to our backend, and we have a data flowing between both of them, and a man in the middle is when someone is trying to, to eavesdrop it. So someone is actually listening to this. Um, of course, it's uh, 2020, and I assume you all use HTTPS, but the question is, can man in the I mean, HTTPS is encrypting the traffic, so uh, in theory, um, a man in the middle would not be possible because uh, then the, the, all the communication is encrypted and, and the hacker cannot see it other than, than just rubbish. But is it possible to have a man in the middle with, with HTTPS? Well, in fact, in the, in the mobile ecosystem, it's, it's more common than, than, uh, than you would think because of the way in which uh, HTTPS works. So when we connect to our backend, the backend is sending us a certificate. This certificate um, has a, a chain of trust which, is, which ends up in a, in a root CA. And what the application does is uh, it follows the chain, gets to root CA, and checks if this root CA is uh, in, a, in a list of trusted CAs. If, if this list of trusted CAs contains the, the CA that we received, then the, um, the application is going to accept the connection and proceed. If it's not, then it's going to deny the connection because the server could not be authenticated. Well, uh, in Android and in iOS, the, the list of trusted CAs is managed by the operating system, which means that if someone manages to get an untrusted CA in this, in this list, then the whole device is uh, vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks. And this is especially worrisome in, in Android because um, in Android we have tens or even hundreds of device manufacturers of OEMs and some of them, if you open uh, a device for certain OEMs and you go to the list of trusted CAs, you would agree with me that some of them are really not trusted or trustworthy. Um, some of them even use uh, uh, algorithms that have been deprecated years ago. And as I said before, it only takes one CA uh, to be compromised for the whole device being vulnerable to, to man in the middles. In iOS or in Android phone or more modern Android phones that are from, from trustworthy OEMs, let's put it like that, uh, it's a bit more difficult because the attack would require uh, reverse engineering uh, and, and both platforms are doing quite a good job in making sure that a user does not install uh, a trusted CA uh, if he's really not knowing what he does. But anyway, a, a non-tech savvy user is, is, is uh, prone to being tricked into installing a, a, an untrusted CA in the list of trusted CAs. And that would, be, that would mean that, the, that his device is, is um, vulnerable to, to man-in-the-middle attacks. And this is why certificate pinning is a very good idea when doing mobile applications. When we do certificate pinning, what we are doing is we are putting the, the certificate that our backend is going to send to the application. We put the certificate within, within the application and when we connect to the backend, we receive the certificate and we compare it with the one that we have stored in the, in the application bundle. And if the certificate is the same, um, we accept the connection. If not, we reject it. And with this, what we are doing is that we are not relying on the operating system. So even if the operating system has untrusted CAs or the, the, the user was tricked into installing, um, into installing a, a, a trusted CA from, from, an, from a hacker, our application remains invulnerable to, to this situation because we only rely on the certificate that we bundle with the application. Of course, certificate pinning has its, its problems. Uh, it has some um, maintenance overhead or, or can be problematic if, for example, your server needs to change a certificate. And this is why it's a good idea to put, uh, to not pin the last certificate, but the second to last certificate in the chain, because the last certificate is more prone to change, and if this happens, then your users would not be able to connect to the backend, so it's, it's always recommended to put the second certificate in the chain. But anyway, both in Android and in iOS, it's very easy to do certificate pinning the, the right way. The, the platforms provide you the tools to, to do this, so I 
it's, it's something I would recommend to, to use certificate pinning when doing mobile apps. Okay, second thing I wanted to talk about is application tampering and repackaging. So what is it? Um, when we talk about uh, application repackaging, what we do is we have someone is willing, to, uh, trying to modify our application for whatever purpose. So he's going to download the app, not to the phone, but to, 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 the, to the workstation. He's going to unpack it. Uh, APKs and IPAs uh, are very easy to, to unpack with, with free tools. He's going to look inside, do static dynamic analysis. He's going to modify it for whatever he's trying to do, pack it again, and try to distribute it. Uh, he's going to distribute it. Uh, there are some uh, side markets. You can just search online. For example, in iOS, the, the, the most common one is, is Cydia for jailbroken phones. Um, and he also might uh, be trying to, um, to distribute it to, to users through social engineering again. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how it looks like. And you might be wondering why someone would want to do this. Well, <laughs> the first one is quite funny for me. It's um, cheating on a game, and, and I use always one example. I'm not sure if you remember that three, four years ago, Pokemon Go was massive. Everyone was playing Pokemon Go. And there was one guy, that I guess he was uh, tired of not uh, achieving his goals in the game, and just modified Pokemon Go so he would be able to capture Pokemons uh, regardless of his location. If you remember, you, you had to be close to the virtual location of a Pokemon to being able to capture it. So he modified the application so he could capture all the Pokemons regardless of where he was. So I don't know why people do this, but this happens, and, and this was quite, quite widespread. Um, a more common one is what I said before about someone trying to get um, premium features for free. So if you look around, you can find Spotify versions that get you the premium Spotify for free. So you go to the, the Cydia markets or, or uh, someone distributing APKs over WhatsApp. They sent me the, the Spotify APK through WhatsApp uh, some, some months ago. Um, and, and it's on with, with this technique. They, someone downloads the application, re modifies it, and redistributes it. Okay, and last is, is the most worrisome from the end user perspective because it's, um, imagine something like that. Um, someone, uh, you, you develop an application, it's not, doesn't have to be a security sensitive application. Uh, imagine it has a, a login screen. Someone downloads this application and does a minor modification in the login screen after the username and password has been sent to the server and, and you know the login is successful, the hacker puts a small snippet of code that is actually sending this information back to the backend. The rest of the application is, remains untouched and the, so the, the hacker tricks the users into installing this application. For example, this could be in the, in the Spotify application that the hacker is distributing because, hey, you get Spotify for free, but there's this small, this is small piece of code that is sending the the username and password uh, to, to the hacker's backend. This is another case. In, in, in this case, what is happening is that the, the, the attacker is, is creating a database of usernames and passwords, and we are human. We tend to reuse usernames. We tend to reuse passwords. So with this, the hacker is going to be able not only to access our Spotify account, but probably our bank, our email, our PayPal, and all sorts of things. And I want to show you how easy it is. Could you please raise your hands? Please read through this code and take it down when you have a rough idea of what it does. You don't need to really understand it, but just like a rough idea. Okay, you want to guess? Exactly. So this is, this is a, um, I actually decompiled it yesterday from a, a small application that I built. I decompiled it with APK tool, which is a, is a free tool that you can download. And this is what APK tool speeds in, in 10 seconds. This is the, 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 um, the Smiley code from an Android application. And it's actually, yeah. Uh, it, it's an onCreate method of an activity, which is the main 
view of, of an Android application. It's setting the content view uh, with, with, from an XML, and then in a text view, it's setting the, the, the string hello bin with this uh, invoke virtual set text method here. When you develop for Android, anything that you do on Java is super easy to reverse engineer. APK tool speeds this, this is a smiley code, which is very human readable. So my first, uh, one of the main things that, uh, that I want to stress is that if you, if you have people developing for Android and you have to put some security sensitive code in your application, don't do it in Java or Kotlin. Kotlin is, is the same. It, it, it uses the, the JVM. You have the option to, I mean, always the first option is always for both in Android and iOS, the, the, the best option is to put um, the security relevant logic in the backend because there we know uh, where it runs and we have full control over it. But if you need to have it on the device, in Android at least it's a very good idea to use the, the NDK. The NDK supports the C and C++ development. Um, and it's very good because then the, the C, C++ code gets compiled to assembly, which is much more difficult to, to understand. For iOS, the, th the, the thing looks a bit different. Um, Swift and Objective-C are, uh, Objective are both compiled to, to assembly, so it's, I mean, it's not impossible. There's certainly people, very skilled people that read assembly like they are reading English, uh, but it's not, not as easy as, as uh, Smiley. And the most common way to, to tamper with uh, iOS applications is through dynamic library injections. In an iOS package, you have like two parts. We have, you have the main, the main application binary, the code that you wrote, and then you have uh, uh, all the dynamic libraries that are uh, compiled through it. And the common attack is to modify this, um, these dynamic libraries to, to achieve uh, a certain behavior because sometimes uh, they are open source or sometimes they are well known, so it's easier to modify them so you the, the, the hacker unpacks the application, replaces the, the dynamic library with the one that he crafted, and distributes it. And, and this is the way that um, that happened for for uh, for the Pokemon Go example that I that I said before. Is there any way that we can uh, prevent our application from being repackaged? Yes. Um, the first thing is what I said before. It's it's anti-analysis techniques. From a static analysis, obfuscation is, is the key, is the way to, to, to go forward. For dynamic analysis is all these sorts of methods like debugger detection, uh, emulator detection, hooking framework detection, so that your application is capable of detecting when it's debugged and, for example, it crashes, preventing the dynamic analysis from, from being successful. The second thing we can do is we can try to detect if the application has been repackaged. Both iOS and Android have a system for controlling, um, for controlling installations, which says that when you install an app, it has to be signed by the developer. So it's not possible to install unsigned applications. We as developers have our signing keys, which in theory are protected, are within our development environment, uh, probably only in our CI system, not even developers have access to it. So what we can do, is we can uh, put the certificate associated to our developer key. We put this certificate inside the application binary or some information of it. And at runtime, we retrieve the actual certificate used to sign the application. If we signed it, then the certificate is going to match. But if a hacker tried to repackage it, he would have had to sign the application again. He doesn't have our key because it's protected in our, in our uh, environment. So he would have had to sign the, the application with his own key. At runtime, we retrieve it, it doesn't match, and then we can crash the application process. Of course, if you do just something like that and, and you're in Android and you do it in, in Java, the hacker is actually modifying our application so he can find the place where we are doing this check and just remove it. So this technique alone does not work. You have to combine it with the, with the anti-analysis techniques because if you do just do it in Java, in 30 minutes, someone can just find it and, 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 and remove it. But the combination of these is, is actually quite effective and, and, prevents, uh, and prevents us from, from doing this. Okay, finally, root and jailbreak. I guess you are all aware um, 
of what root and, and jailbreak is, but um, just to make sure that, that we are all talking about the same, I'm going to give a brief introduction. Both iOS and Android base their security models in the, in the sandbox concept, which means that each application runs in isolation from one another. Each application runs in its own process, has its memory space, has a, a dedicated storage space, and this is what you can see here. This is uh, from an Android emulator, and in each row is an install application, it, and what you can see here is that each application upon its cell time is assigned a unique user and group ID. And if you see the permissions, only the, this user and group has full access to the data directory of the application, and exactly no one else has access to, to its data directory. When we root our phone or we jailbreak our iPhone, what we are doing is we are uh, using a, a privilege escalation exploit to allow software in the device to run as the root user. The root user is a special user in the, in the Unix system, which is not bound to this kind of rules. So what we are doing is we are allowing someone to become God on our system. When someone is capable of running uh, software as root in our system, they can do whatever they want. They are not bound to these rules or they are not bound to most of the security, um, security measures of the operating system. What we are allowing this software to do is to escape this sandbox, okay? This, you can imagine, is, is quite dangerous. So we may want to, to be able to detect root. Luckily, uh, root can be detected there, uh, root or jailbreak. Well, I use, just use the word root because it's easier, but when I, I'm talking about both uh, indistinctively. Um, it can be detected. You can find projects in, in libraries in GitHub. There's some people that is doing quite a good job in, in finding them, actually. have some, some references here. Um, you can search in Stack Overflow. Um, even Google is providing, through the safety net at the station API, Google is providing uh, some sort of root detection, which is managed by them through the Google Play services. So you don't have to worry about keeping it up to date. You just ask the Google Play services API an attestation about the health of the phone, and they, uh, they keep it up to date. They do their magic. They return an attestation to you. And this attestation contains, among other things, whether the device is rooted or not. But the thing uh, with root detection is, since we said that when someone is running as root, they can do whatever they want on the phone. It means that they can also trick the root detection techniques into believing that it is indeed not rooted. And the, um, let's say the, the complexity of the root detection is what is going to uh, decide whether this uh, check is successful or not. Again, it's, about, uh, it's a matter of time. If you have um, a very sophisticated root detection mechanism that checks 50 different things, the hackers have, is going to have to invest a lot of time in trying to trick all these 50 things. If you just have something that you grab from Stack Overflow that checks two files, probably it's going to take a few hours, but the hacker is going to be able to, to bypass this, this root detection. But the real question to me is not whether root can be detected or not. Let's assume it can. Um, the real question for me is what can we do if we detect root? Because we have two scenarios. We have, on the one hand side, we have the users that have rooted or jailbroken their device because they want to. We have the users that have Cydia because they want to install applications that are not available on the App Store. We have users that have installed Magisk on Android because they want to modify, they want to modify their, um, their operating system beyond what Android offers them. And so we have a part of our users that have willingly rooted or jailbroken their devices. On the other side, we have the devices that have been a target of remote root exploits. And this is um, from August, this, this summer, and, and it serves to me to explain what root can do. It, it, that was actually uh, a research from Google Project Zero, which showed that there had been uh, a set of web pages that had been out in the wild for three, four years, I believe, I don't remember exactly, that when visited through Safari in an iPhone, they would um, use a, would exploit a vulnerability in, in the Safari stack, would install a piece of malware uh, that would run as, as the root user, and would connect to a command and control center, 
sending uh, all sorts of data. So the, the command and control server would be, okay, send me the, 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 the contacts, send me the messages, send me the data for this application. And all of this without the user knowing or, or noticing anything. And this malware would be running in the background. I think it was until the, the device was rebooted. So most of us never turn off our phones, so indefinitely. And this, as I said, um, targeted iPhones from very old until the lat latest one. And it had been out for three or four years, infecting thousands of, of users. So again, the thing is, what do we do? Oh, yeah, there are the, the links in case you want to you want to check. We can do nothing. So for example, if you are developing um, a, a weather application, probably it's okay for you to run on, on rooted devices. It's not a big deal. Crap, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, we could restrict some sensitive functionality. We can let our application run, but let's say if we have a banking application, uh, Probably not the best example, but it serves. Um, we can allow the user to check his account, but not make operations, like not wire money, because we don't trust the application. But yeah, can be a bit weird from the, from the user perspective. We can deny service. We can show a pop-up when the application is running and say, sorry, this device is rooted. Uh, you don't want to, we, we don't allow you to, to move forward and to, and to use our application in your device. But of course, from we are service providers. We want more user, not less users. Um, so it's probably not, not the best idea. And the last thing we can do is we can design our security model knowing that root can and actually will happen. It's very likely that if we have a, a big enough user base, um, some of these users are going to, to, be, to, to have rooted devices. What we can do is something, for example, like if we have, uh, we have to store sensitive data on the phone, we can store it in such a way that when some sort of malware, like we, we explained before, if this malware is capable of, of sending this data to a backend, that this data is not readable from the backend. So there is some sort of logic that is in the binary, in our application binary, that is decrypting this data. It doesn't need to be encryption, but that is doing some sort of transformation for it to, to make it readable. So that would, that would be an example of, of what I mean when I say that, that we design our security model um, according to root. But, but the, the, the main point here is that what I want you to take away is that you need to know that root is something that is going to happen and you have to have an answer for that. Whether it's doing nothing because you are doing a weather app, that's, that's fine, but you have to, to have a plan. Okay, last slide. Um, what are the main things that I want you to, to take home? The first one from the introduction is that in mobile, 100% protection does not exist. If someone comes and tells you that they have the perfect solution and, and it's unbreakable, it's not true. If, if, I assure you, if the NSA comes in and decide that they want to hack your application, they are going to do it, no matter what you do. When talking about networking, certificate pinning is a very good idea. Uh, Android and iOS provide uh, very good tools for doing that. Um, so it's, it's uh, a good idea to do so. When it comes to reverse engineering, um, try to move everything possible to the backend. The backend is under your control and everything that you do there, there is more safe than uh, anything you do on, on mobile. But of course, it's not always possible if you have to support, for example, offline use cases. You are, yeah, sometimes moving things to the backend is, is not going to be an option. But if you decide to put some sensitive logic uh, in the, the application, try to obfuscate it, and in Android, just never do it in Java or Kotlin. Never move it to the, to the native layer. And finally, about root, what we just said, uh, be aware that this a very big problem uh, if you have rooted uh, users. Just be aware of it and decide whether how this affects you, what is at stake for you, and, and what is, is your answer to this. Okay? So with this, I want to thank you again, and if you have any questions. Thank you, Mark, for this awesome talk and overview about mobile app security. We have some questions. Um, and I'm going to start with the first one. 
What is your recommended way of storing keys inside a mobile application? Um, <clears throat> so in, in iOS, it's fairly easy because since uh, the first iPhone that had the fingerprint years ago, they have uh, the secure enclave, uh, which is uh, hardware protected. Uh, it's an isolated part of the processor, uh, which has crypto storage. So in, in iOS, I would just use the secure enclave. That's the best way. In Android, the, it's called Hardware Bad Key Store or Strongbox since Android 9. Um, but it's not as prominent. Uh, so in Android, you can check if, if this kind of hardware backed key store is, is available. Uh, if not, you have the, the white box option. White box is a technology for special for these kind of things. Um, there is, for all the Android phones, uh, white box I would say is the, is the only secure approach. If you try to store the keys in the software, it's, yeah, I wouldn't do so. Is the Android documentation on you know, using the keychain and the hardware security model, is it good? Is that the recommended way to go to look up how to store the keys in Android, for example? It's definitely better in Android than in iOS. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I would. It's not clear that the, um, the differences between the hardware and the software, so it's a bit tricky to, to find it. But yeah, I think the documentation is, is a very good starting point. With your insights, would you consider one mobile platform significantly more or less, more or less secure than others? So iOS, different Android platforms? No, so certainly iOS is, is... Okay, it's easier to develop security for iOS than it is for Android. If you compare iOS 13 and Android 10, I think they are mostly on par, but the problem that you have in Android is that you have Android devices running back to Android 4 or Android 5. And if you compare Android 5 to iOS 13, there's a huge difference. So in iOS, you have all the devices running the latest version. Like in six months, you have 80% of the devices running the latest platform. And in Android, that's something that doesn't happen. So the problem in, in Android is securing the oldest models. And, and that's the main security problem that you so have. So maintaining backwards compatibility is the biggest challenge there. Mm -hmm. um, what's your opinion on the OWASP mobile, mobile ASVS, so the application security verification standard, especially the anti-reversing requirements? Have you had a look at those? Um, I'm not an expert on, on, the, on, the, on the topic. I've looked into it, so I think it's a good starting point. So it's, it, I would recommend anyone that has some security concerns for the application to, to take it as a starting point. Depending on the kind of applications, it may not be enough. At the end, it's, it's security principles, but if you want to de develop measures for every single thing, you will have to have a, a dedicated security team. So it's a very good reference. It's going to take you a lot of time to implement every single check in there and to maintain it up to date. Which open source code obfuscation tool for Android do you recommend? I'm not aware of any open source obfuscation tool. I mean, there, there's ProGuard that, that comes with, with Android Studio, but ProGuard is more a minifier than, than an obfuscator um, because it, it just removes that code and renames the methods, and there are tools that automatically reverse this, so it's, from the obfuscation perspective, it's not that good. And, and they have their, their uh, uh, paid version, which is uh, DexGuard. Uh, but of course, it's, it's, it's paid, it's not open source. So I'm, I'm really not aware of any open source uh, obfuscation tool. Um, what is uh, the source of the data you used in the investment monetization diagrams you showed? Sorry? Um, you showed diagrams about the inv invest, um, investment and monetization of, of an attack, so you want to push up, you may want to make it more expensive for the attacker and less ah, revenue no, no. for the attacker. Where did okay, you okay. get the data from? No, I, I just made that up as an example. It's, it's not real data, sorry. Sorry if, I, if someone <laughs> misunderstood this. It, it was just to serve the purpose of explaining the, the goal. Okay. Can a root user on Android or iOS read out keys from the key, chains, uh, key change of the OS? Not in theory, because the, the, the advantage of these uh, crypto processors we were talking about, the secure enclave and the hardware back key store and the strong box, the advantage is that they, they store the keys outside of the, of the main operating system. 
Having said that, there are exploits or known exploits for, for the secure end cloud uh, in, in iOS. I'm not sure if there are any for the hardware back history. I mean, the, the, advantage of, the advantage of Android is that this kind of thing's different from OEM to OEM. Uh, that's the, the hardware back history, not something that is part of the AOSP, the, the open source project. So since it's, uh, it's more diverse, there's less people trying to hack it. In iPhone, there's a lot of people trying to hack the Security Club for years, so th there have been some, some, some exploits from the Security Club. So no, root does not give you access to these keys, but there are other exploits that, that, uh, that attack the, the Security Club that can uh, expose these keys, but are much, much more difficult and much, much more rare than, than a root exploit. Mm -hmm. The next question regards uh, certificate pinning. Mm -hmm. So the question says, how do you switch pin certificates in production securely without affecting availability? So, for example, um, well, the, the, the thing that I said before is that you don't want to pin the last, uh, the, 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 um, the last certificate in the chain. You want to pin the second to last one because this one is much uh, less prone to change. But for example, what... Uh, if you look into the Android documentation, they allow you to actually pin two certificates, and one pin uh, has an expiration date. So the, the, the operating system itself is actually looking at the pin sets and saying, okay, up to this day, I have to use this one. After this date, uh, I will use this other one. But there are mechanisms for, for doing so. Um, yep. Are the conclusions about financial motivations for hackers really applicable to activist hackers? Even with expected negative income, they might do it. Not a question, actually. Certainly, and, and pen testers are well. Pen testers have a different motivation. So it's... it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they have, you have their, your income from different sources, not, not from actually the, the getting benefit of, out of the exploit. So. But when you have ethical hackers or, or pen testers, um, it's because you want to assess your, your security level, not because uh, someone is trying to make uh, advantage out of it. Mm. So. Maybe one final question. Um, in the long run and facing attackers with always more resources or skills, isn't running code on untrusted or untrustable platforms a battle you can only lose, like with DRM, for example, in the past? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Um, so, in the long run, isn't all the things where you showed us kind of a battle that you can only lose? This is how I interpret this question. Because um, there will always be attackers with more resources, skills. Mm. Indeed. It's, it's a cat and mouse game. You have to put as many hurdles as you can uh, to make it very difficult. But as I said, if, if, if the NSA decides that your application is a target, they are going to break it. So. This is why it's difficult to do security in-house, because it's not doing it... I mean, you can de develop a root detection mechanism for Android in, in one or two weeks, and it's going to work, but after three months, there will be a new root mechanism that you are not going to be capable of, of detecting with, the, with what you did three months ago. So you have to invest one more week in trying to get it up to date. And, and this happens with root detection, jailbreak, debugger, emulator, hooking framework. Mm -hmm. and if you want to maintain this, uh, that's, that's a problem, that it's, it's a cat and mouse game, and you have to constantly involve resources in, in, in staying up on the game. Cool. Thank you very much, Mark, for this very good talk, and thanks for coming all the way from Barcelona to Vienna. Give a last applause to Mark. Thank you.